What is up, everybody? This is Chase, and welcome back to the Wellness Center podcast. Guys, I'm so grateful that you are here today. Thank you for joining in on another amazing episode where my guest that I have on today is an amazing guy. He is a foreigner, which is really cool. So we're all going to enjoy his accent for the next hour. And again, just super excited to have him on today. Guys, I hope everyone's having a good week. I hope everyone is doing good. I just started a new regimen this week where I'm boxing in the morning. I'm waking up at 5 a.m., which is a few hours earlier than what I normally do. So if I look like I'm falling asleep, it's probably because I am. <laughs> so that's that's totally okay. But again, guys, please make sure to like and subscribe to whatever platform you're on. Make sure to follow. Give us a thumbs up and a comment to let us know how we're doing. I'm super grateful that everyone is here. Guys, I want to go ahead and just introduce my my guest because I am super, super excited to have him on. Guys, so my guest, is a he's been in the personal and professional development world for over 15 years. He is focused on driving people to inspire and empower them. He's a senior account technology strategist at Microsoft, specializing in digital transformation. He's a certified neuroencoding specialist. He's the host of the Unleash Thyself podcast, which fosters inspiration and connection. He's dedicated to the nurturing and growth mindsets and helping individuals achieve their full potential. He has a philosophy rooted in learning, love, and play, and he believes in the collective power to create positive impact. So without further ado, I have Constantine on the show. Constantine, how are you doing, bro? Chase, what an introduction, brother. How do I even follow that? I'm excellent. And it sounds like I have to do a really good job to keep you awake throughout this <laughs> I, episode. I'll do my best. I have no doubt you're absolutely going to rock it, bro. I am so grateful that you're coming on today. So where where are you located, bro? I'm calling in all the way from Canada on the from East Canada? Coast of Canada. Yes. The East Coast of Canada. So what time is it over there? Uh, it's five o'clock right now. Oh, okay. That's not too bad. It's to my time. Yeah. So no, yeah. dude, that's super cool. So Canada, man, that's cool, man. Are you from Canada? Oh, well, I was born in Eastern Europe, moved mm -hmm. to Canada over two decades ago now when I was 17. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. Well, dude, give us a, a couple more cookie cutter answers as to who you are and what you do, Constantine, just so we can get to know you a little bit better. Yeah. So I'll start with the juicy part. Today, as you mentioned, you'll find me playing a dual or multi-role, if you may, right? I'm a technology strategist at Microsoft doing sales, loving that part of it. But then in all my spare time, I'm all about inspiring and empowering others on this beautiful life journey so they too can shine their light. And that means I help people in one-on-one -on -one coaching. I help people in group coachings, but I also have my podcast, Unleash Yourself, which you mentioned. Now, how did I get here, you may ask, because that's a question that many people ask, how do I have time to do all of these things? Well, you see, three years ago, while I was still working in a great job at Microsoft, I ran into a roadblock, which was my mental health. Because I was working so hard, I was pushing myself so much as a high achiever and top performer. Those of you listening, you probably can relate. You work hard because everyone tells you the more you work, the better your results, the more success you have. And to some degree, that's true. And that, that's how my life has been up to that point. But then you get to a part in your life where you realize that perhaps you have been living the life of someone else, not the life you have dreamed for yourself or dreamt for yourself. And in my case, I didn't even know what my goals or objectives truly really were because I've always was, you know, played by the rules of others, my parents, my caregivers, my teacher, my, my mentors, my coaches, my, my environment, really. And that was the huge turning point for me in life to go from someone that, yes, had the quote-unquote American dream, had achieved success in many areas of life, to someone that truly plays by his own rules, gets to create time, for everything that he loves and just be in a place of consistent joy and fulfillment, regardless of what the environment throws at me. So that's me chasing uh, the show. Dude, I love that, Constantine. That's amazing, man. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. And, and I love that you're getting to this point where you're free. And I'm so excited to talk about that today. Yes. So, dude, I know you kind of mentioned that you, for a long time, were a product of your environment with your teachers and your parents and all that kind of stuff. I would love for you to take us back to a young Constantine. When were some of the first times that you noticed you were struggling with your mental health? I'll be honest with you. I would say my ego or my mind prevented me from realizing that I was actually struggling with my mental health throughout my 
later teens and adulthood. Because you see, I moved to Canada when I was 17, which meant that there was a time when I left behind everything I knew up to that point, including friends, high school, sweetheart, dog, you name it, family, all of that. So that I would say, looking back, that would be the first time when I really struggled with my place in the world because I went from what everything I knew to something brand new and having to rebuild a life with school, learning a new language, all the things that come with it. Now, of course, in the moment, I didn't realize that, nor did I have, I would say, the mental health support or emotional support I would have liked now that I look back. But as you go through life, right, you have different milestones happening that perhaps challenge your mental health. It could be when you have to make a decision to go to university or pursue something else. When you have to go into the work fit force, right? Or pursue something else. When you have to make a choice between, am I gonna work for someone or am I gonna work for myself? When you have to make a choice, am I gonna follow in the footsteps of my parents and go to engineering, like in my case, or do something that I love, like psychology? Spoiler alert, I went to engineering, then mathematics, and never actually followed through on my passion of psychology until much later in life, which is where the neuroencoding certification and all the neuroscience and psychology background comes from, from my passion and doing it in my spare time. So as you can see, as, as you go through your life, there are many stages at which you're being, let's say, tested and also seeds of doubt or seeds of happiness and fulfillment get planted. And for me, there were a lot of seeds in both categories planted along my journey. Because as I mentioned, I've been successful in many different areas, and most of you listening are very successful in some areas, but then at the same time, you may struggle in other areas. And in the areas that you struggle in, that's where your mental health gets impacted and it can drag down everything else, which is what happened to me back in 2021 and 2022 when everything pretty much hit rock bottom. Oh man, dude, that's crazy. Thank you for sharing all of that gold already. Like, I love that you just get right into it and you're like, here's the truth. Here's the realization. And I know anyone that's listening to this can, can relate with that. I, so I'm curious, these seeds of doubt, when you move, you're 17, right? You come to this new country. What were some of those seeds of doubt that were planted in your head at that time? Well, a couple of things that come up right away for me were, of course, the language barrier. So doubt in my ability to make friends, connect with people, friends outside my culture, because the place where we moved had a lot of other Romanian people. So we could communicate in the language that we knew, but not knowing English, which I knew very little of, was a challenge and that planted seeds of doubt, right? Hit at the self at the confidence piece as well. And then I was really big into soccer growing up. I mean, I played at a very high level, played quite a bit of it. Not coming to a country that doesn't care much for soccer, and back when I came in 2000 to Canada, there weren't a lot of places where one like myself could go and play, especially not like I used to in Romania, where I could I would go to school, then come home, take my ball and go play because there were so many fields. I couldn't do that here as much, right? So that again, planted seeds of like, well, I had an identity, who am I now? Mm -hmm. And you know, when you go through life and you pour everything you have into your work, or into your family, or into a partner, a spouse, right? Or into someone you care for. And then all of a sudden, the relationship breaks down, or someone moves on or passes away, or you lose your job. And all of a sudden, you ask yourself the question, well, what's next? What happens then, right? Because our identity, if it's placed into something external of us, that we're at the mercy of it, right? We're at the mercy of your environment, which is exactly the situation I was in because my identity was external of me for most of my life in my teenage years and beyond. Yeah, wow. Dude, that's that's true. It's true. You know, like, yeah, I love that, man. I, I love your... I love your willingness to get in there and just share what you were going through, man. So what... Sorry, let me rephrase that. So like in... In Canada, I know that there's a lot of different languages in there. I know it's there's the French parts, the English parts. You were you were in an English speaking area of Canada. Yes, exactly. I was in Ontario, which is the biggest and most populated part of Canada, more central Canada, and that was English speaking primarily. But like you said, it's such a diverse country, pretty much like the states as well, and you have so many different cultures. And the area I was in was particularly diverse. Right, well, many people from Eastern Europe, some Western Europe. Africa, Asia, you name it. And that was actually a great part of um, 
my upbringing there because I got exposed to different cultures, which was something that, of course, back home in Romania, I never did. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, dude. And so what? Like, how long do you feel it took you? Like, how long did it take you to adjust to the culture of Canada? Huh. I love the question because, and I, you know, I side that a bit because it took a long time. And I don't think I ever really adjusted properly until much later in life. And the reason being is that I was so stuck in what you would call a fixed mindset, in maybe being bitter about having to leave things behind, about not being able to do the same things here, not embracing the change and the growth mindset so it probably you know took until like at least my mid mid 20s i would say right so that's about eight nine years yeah dude that's quite a long time and like at that at that eight or nine year point what kind of broke in you that allowed you to start embracing the new culture that you were in you know what they say time heals everything time has a way to get you to accept certain realities, even if you agree or don't agree with them, even if they're true or they're not true. And that's pretty much what happened to me. I've lived here long enough where I had forgotten more of what was before, right? Yeah. Because was, so I moved when I was 17, I went back when I was 18 and 19, but then I haven't been back since, right? Gotcha. So that, a lot of immersion in, in the North American culture. And of course, started in the workforce as well after finishing university had a couple of businesses, right? So I was fully immersing myself in. And yeah, time just happened to heal a lot of things, but also at the same time, bury a lot of them in, which would surface much later. Right. And that brings us to the the question that, you know, when you mentioned how everything broke down in 2021. So dude, yeah. So let's hear what happened in 2021 that broke you down. What was this extreme? And the official question I want to bring it in is what extreme trial or hero's journey did you have to go through? Yeah, I love the question, Chase. Love it, love it, love it. Well, let's start with this. You know, when (laughs) you go through life and you do things the way you're supposed to do them, right? You go to school, you get a good degree, or you pick up a trade and you start working right away, or you go into the entrepreneurial world and you start right away and you follow someone's blueprint or someone's recommendations, or it could be multiple people. Well, that was was me. I followed in the footsteps I mentioned with my parents first and what they thought would be best and then teachers and mentors and whatnot. And one thing led to another. I was always in between doing something entrepreneurially and then being in the corporate world or being in the business world. And because of my degree in mathematics, computer science, engineering, I was always pulled into the corporate world, even though I wanted to be my own boss, challenge the status quo, be the one creating. And I always said that mix. Well, Fast forward to about seven years ago, so this will this will put us 2017, is when I made a huge jump from a smaller company to the behemoth of Microsoft, which for me was a huge accomplishment at the time because the competition to get in for such jobs, right, is immense. But it also means that you're joining an environment that's filled with high performers, top performers. Now, I came from an environment where I was always a high performer, top performer, which is why I got hired, but also an environment where it wasn't just filled with high performers and top performers. There were people early in their career that didn't care as much to be a top performer. There were people that were just enjoying a nine to five and they don't care about going above and beyond for the company or for themselves. But when you join a company that has the luxury of hiring the best of the best, that almost everyone, if not everyone, are top performers, which meant that for me to stand out, I had to go above and beyond. So yeah, I need to work hard. Right? Anyone listening to this may have seen themselves in that in that position, right? You start a new job and you realize that to stand out, well, you need to maybe work extra hours. Maybe you need to study more. Maybe you need to do things that normally you wouldn't do. Anyway, so I started doing that in 2017. And of course, the pandemic hit here the same as it did everywhere else. And I happened to be part of a team that worked on enabling people to work from home with Microsoft Teams, which, and of course, when the pandemic hit, most people did not necessarily have Zoom. They didn't have Microsoft Teams. They still had older technologies and they didn't necessarily have a way to work from home. And we're talking about corporate office people mostly here that I worked with. So that meant for me to be able to truly give back and impact people I said, you know what, I'm going to work harder than ever and I'm going to go through this. I'm going to push hard because 
I also saw the impact my work was making, not just at the, let's call it the, the, the money level for Microsoft, but also the impact in someone's life because someone now can work from home while they're watching their children and not have to worry about their job, right? Which was a big fear during the pandemic for most people. I, even in America, that was a huge <clears throat> issue. Exactly, right? Because this is across North America. And I worked primarily with Canadian customers, but also some American customers as well, mm -hmm. right? So gotcha. I had experience across the board, but you're absolutely right. It was a huge issue everywhere. So it gave me a lot of joy and fulfillment to do that. But doing it for what? Two plus years at like 60, 70 hours a week took its toll on me. And again, my identity now was tied to my job at Microsoft. At this point, I didn't have any entrepreneurial um side gig so to speak that i've had up to that point and i just focused 100 percent on progressing advancing my career i mean i got the promotion in, in in the process of that right because i was i was doing a lot of great things but in doing a lot of those great things i got to sacrifice other things so you know when you think that oh you know what i'm just going to do this next year or in a few months when I have time, or when I have money, or when I get the promotion, or when such and such happens. Well, that was me. I was essentially ignoring my self-care, ignoring my, my health, mental health, emotional health, physical health, for all this career stuff, right? Like progressing, 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 because that's what I've learned. And that's what the gurus tell you, right? You got to climb up the corporal ladder. When you get to the top, that's when you make it. That's when you can take a day off and celebrate. And the you reality know, is... Sorry, no, I, I just want yeah. to speak. I want to speak to that and ask your opinion on something really quick. So yeah, of course. I feel like so often these books and these stories and all of these successful people, they're like, I went in and I put five years and I destroyed my mental health. And that's not the right way to do it. But Every single successful book that I've read so far, all of these you know successful people, you including now, they go through these few years of just total commitment. And then they, they make these books where they say like, hey, you don't have to do that. You can do it this way instead. So why do you think, yeah. why, why do you think they say you don't have to? Yeah, every story says that's the right way to go about it. <laughs> I love the chase so much. You see, the way I, I see it now, based on psychology, neuroscience, physiology, evolution of us as human beings, we tend to learn best from experiences, right? That we have to go through certain things ourselves to be able to understand. And then another way we learn and we get motivated to is through stories, story, people telling us stories. Those books that you reference, and, I, and I've read a lot of what the gurus say, right? they focus on propagating, I would say, what I would call a fear that's innate with all human beings, the fear of failure and then the fear of rejection. And the idea of like, you got to work hard to achieve. You got to go, you know, put in the hours to get what you want. You got to trample over everyone else to get to your piece of the pie, right? That's a lot of the stuff that we see. And until you get to try a bit of it, it's very hard for you to realize that that's probably not aligned with who you are at the core, at the heart level, probably not aligned with who you are as a human race, probably not aligned with who you are spiritually, right? With your God or the universe or the higher self. And you have to experience that for yourself before you can say, you know what? I've taken that road. It's not for me. And now I want to go on a different road. But when you want to go on a different road, you stumble upon some of the books you mentioned which emphasize working hard, doing all those things that we talked about, or other books or podcasts or videos that, that claim to have the one trick to make you feel better and to make you successful. And now you start jumping from one to the other, trying things, and you end up failing. And the more you fail, the more you beat yourself up, the more self-doubt creeps in, the more you look for quick answers because you're like, well, I just went through a cycle of like five years. I've wasted five years of my life. Let me find the next thing that can quickly get me out of it. And that's why we fall prey to this type of, let's call them manipulative in a way, content pieces, because they prey on these fears that are innate with you and everything else that's negative that's been built in. Because you see negativity bias, which you're likely familiar with and everyone listening, it's innate within us all human beings because up to like, what, 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't very safe for you and I to be out in the world, which meant that 
we had to evolve with a brain that looked at anything negative and allowed it to hit us faster than anything positive. Because imagine a scenario, you're sitting by the fire with your tribe, enjoying a beautiful chat. Maybe someone is playing the drums, singing. All of a sudden, some tigers jump out of the bushes and start, you know, attacking people. Like if you're going to focus on the positive, the idea of the fire, all the stuff, and that's the first thing that comes to you, you're going to get eaten by the tiger and there's no more you. So the negativity has to hit you first because in that moment, you're like, oh, something bad is happening. I must run or fight. Some people freeze, right? And you now have a system. So let's call it our physiology that works against you because in today's day and world, day and age, it's not that we don't have as many dangers, but they're minimized. And our system is active all the time, which means that someone that doesn't have good intention, let's say they just want to profit off of you. They can easily play, play you by tapping into that negativity bias. And that's what we see with a lot of books, a lot of social media posts, a lot of divisive content out there. I hope that answers your question, but that's how I see it. Dude, that was a great answer. I didn't know what to expect. And you just, you had the answer there. I love that. Thank you so much. So, sorry, let's get off the tangent. Let's get back. So <laughs> you're you're hustling really hard. You're a few years you're dedicated. You're working 60 hours, all of these achievements. Your mental health is suffers because of it. Yeah. So let me give you a statistic here that your audience and yourself might be surprised with. I didn't realize this until more recently. And this is based on studies in psychology. And I'll give you the statistic by asking you a question, Chase. Let's say in your job, I'm going to give you a raise. How long is that raise going to keep you happy for? You Before know, you start questioning things again, if things are not great. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. It depends on, for me personally, it's the the workload that I'm doing, right? If you give me, if you say, hey, I'm giving you a $4 raise and you've got these six other things to do, I'll keep doing those. But the minute you say, hey, here's the seventh thing, I'm like, I'm not compensated for that. Right. Let's keep the, but, let's keep the same workload. I'm just gonna give you more money. Is it gonna make you happy for six months, a year, two years? Let's say I'll give you a ten dollar raise. Anyone listening, you get a ten dollar raise. It's a good day. You know, it's until my. Oh, I'm trying to think about it. Oh, it's a great question. So for me, it would probably be I would adjust my lifestyle to fit the needs of the ten dollar, and I would end up being in the same exact place I was before I got the $10 raise. And then I would be unhappy because I wouldn't be me. You know, I wouldn't have the excess. I wouldn't have the savings. My lifestyle would be the same because my subconscious would be fulfilling the same thing just on a different dollar amount. So I'd probably give it six to eight months before. Six to eight months? Yep. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what I assumed as well. I thought, you know, six months, six to 12 months. What they found in studies is three weeks. That's all. Three weeks. Yeah. Three weeks, that's it? And then, I mean, because, yeah, you, imagine what happens. You get the raise, you get the promotion. You're There's happy, the dopamine dump. You celebrate. Yeah, right? You celebrate. But then reality hits after three weeks, right? If you are unhappy in the job, you're still going to be unhappy. If you're happy in the job, you're still going to be happy. Everything stays the same, assuming, you know, you got the promotion that was, the, you know, or the raise and nothing else changed, right? So when they looked at it, it's about three weeks, which means that if I want to keep an employee happy, if I want to keep you happy, Chase, I have to give you a raise every three weeks, or I actually have to address the things that keep make you unhappy. Maybe celebrating you more, maybe acknowledging what you do more, maybe actually changing the work environment, maybe reducing your workload, all these other things. Mm -hmm. Now, we're looking at a company doing this for some, right? But I always love to look at that and say, how does that relate to my life? Well, how do we give raises to ourselves? So we buy a shiny object, right? Mm -hmm. we go out for dinner. We watch a show on TV, on Netflix. We go browsing on, <laughs> on our phones. That's how you reward yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, there's the same type of thing that the company does when they give you a raise and they don't change anything else. You're not changing who you are. You're not changing what brought you to the unhappiness in the first place. You're just adding a distraction and maybe a small delay to it. And that was my life. And the reason I mentioned that is because in 2021, I believe is when I got my raise and sorry, my promotion, which of course came with a hefty raise and everything else. And I was so happy and excited because I worked so hard for like a year or so before that to, to push for the promotion. And then the reality hit. Nothing else changed. I was still 
not necessarily aligned with my heart. I was working too many hours because that's the environment I created, not because Microsoft was pushing me to do that. I chose to do that. None of the stuff changed. So unless I made conscious choices to make the changes, then that raise meant very little. Sure, you know, I could go out once, you know, once or twice more per month or per week, right? I could buy another shiny toy. But those are all distractions. Right. So you know when you wake up <laughs> sometimes in the morning and you're like, I don't want to get out of bed. This is too hard. You know, I, I'm not looking forward to this day. Well, that was me almost every day of the week, especially the work days, because I knew that I would get up at whatever it was eight o'clock then. By nine, I would start working and I wouldn't be done till like seven, eight PM at night. And by then I'll be too exhausted to do anything else. And I would play some computer games, watch Netflix, and then go to bed. And then I would just wait for the weekend where I would catch up on sleep sometime with my partner or my dogs. And that was it. That was my life. And yet from the outside, people are like, well, you have the shiny toys, you know, the house, the car, or the cars at the time. You have a great partner. You have a great family. You have a great career, right? You have everything. I wish I had your life, right? And I, mm -hmm. I kept thinking to myself, I'm like, well, only if you knew, right? Because I, I didn't feel like that. Right. Like, again, I would buy a shiny toy and it would make me happy for an hour or two or a day or two, and that, that was it. And it was all about the fact that, and for those that are watching this, I have a sign up top there that says, follow your heart. Well, I wasn't following my heart. I wasn't even sure what, what there was in my heart to follow to begin with. And that's really when things in 2021 started to be put in question. I was like, you know, what am I doing with my life? I did what the guru said. I did what my parents thought would be best. I did what my teachers said would be best. Yet, I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. Yeah. What gives? And that set up in motion the next part of my journey, which was because like other high achievers, you try to do it all yourself, right? Why bother bothering someone else you gotta do it all yourself and i was the same i was like well i'm not really gonna go to a therapist because i've tried it before that it's not for me i'm just mm -hmm. gonna read i'm gonna do it myself and i did right i one of the things i ended up doing was booking myself a three-week retreat in ecuador well three-week vacation in ecuador that included a 12-day retreat a mental health retreat and cool. that was for 2022 in april because the borders in Canada stayed closed a bit longer than they stayed in the States or other parts of the world. So for me to get out, I had to wait like a whole eight months after this realization, which was in a way great because it allowed me to have something to look forward to at that time. Right. Dude, that's yeah. awesome. So yeah, keep going. So you go on this retreat and you get into the realm of mental health. So in, in this retreat, I'm sure you learned a lot. So let's bring in the next question of coping skills. So from this point, you realize... Crap's broken. Time to get it fixed. What coping skills did you develop and how did they, how have they evolved over time? Well, before I even ask, answer the coping skills, right? The retreat itself, first of all, Ecuador is an amazing country. Never been to. I chose to go by myself because I wanted some solo time so I could reflect, right? One of the things I realized between 2021 and 2022 is the power of self-reflection, right? The self-discovery, the going, going inwards because most of my life I've been externalizing things, right? As a man growing up in Eastern Europe during the communist time, you know, boys don't cry, you gotta pull your pants up, you're not showing emotions, you're not dealing with emotions because no one teaches you how to deal with emotions. And it wasn't until, you know, 2021 when I decided to do something with it. There weren't any coping mechanisms at this point, by the way, other than the things I used to escape, which one of them was food, one of them was Netflix, one of them was sex, one of them was um, gaming, on the computer and whatnot and on my phone. But this retreat included something called a plant medicine. You know, in, in my case, it was ayahuasca and St. Pedro for those that are familiar. These are indigenous plants that grow in the Amazonian jungle and the tribes throughout the Amazon have been using this plant medicine for thousands of years in rites of passage ceremonies in ceremonies of finding oneself, in ceremonies of connecting to your divine, whatever your divine is, to your God, and so on. And I've been someone that's never been drunk, nor taken drugs, going to do something like this in a country I've never been to, in the jungles of Ecuador. That's wild. And, it, and that was the best thing I ever did for myself. And that's the crazy part. That's so cool, man. It's So I've done, um, oh, what's it, ketamine. 
Ketamine, okay. I, I've done ketamine quite a bit to help with my stuff. I've I have some friends who have gone the ayahuasca route. Uh, I just, actually just had a lady reach out to me who is going the MDMA route. Yeah. But yeah, yeah let's hear about this ayahuasca experience. That's, <laughs> so it's the best thing that ever happened to you. It was the best thing because it opened my, my eyes. It opened my mind. I was a non-spiritual person going into this. I was always curious. I was always open-minded. I grew up as an Orthodox Christian Orthodox in Romania, but then I became an agnostic later in life. And after this point, I was curious because certain things happened in my life I couldn't necessarily explain with my science background, but I was also a big skeptic because of my science background. So I got to this city, which was 12 days, and it changed my life. I mean, it, it put me on the path to be what I am today, but not without first hitting what you know some would call the dark night of the soul, which I believe is what happened with me when I came back. Because at the retreat, essentially, even without the medicine, but with the medicine, my mind got opened. I got to see things I was doing right or wrong, how things could be in the world, how I could be better as a human being, how... I could prioritize certain things differently, how I have to go in within my heart and find what is, is truly there. You know, the reason I'm here on this planet to begin with, and I call it our why or our purpose. I got to experience all of that. And then I got to meet some amazing people. And many of them are still friends to this day, which blew my mind because all I've spent is between seven and 12 days with these people. And they became closer friends than most other friends I've made in my life. Right. So all those things combined opened up everything for me. But when I came back in May of 2022, between May and December of 2022, my mental health was at its worst. That's when my suicidal thoughts came in. My um, Some of my days were really, really bad, like not getting out of bed type bed. But there was a lot of good stuff that happened as well. The thing was though, why it happened? Because I could no longer hide with my distractions. I could no longer just bury things down and hope that they disappear. And things came up. And the more I sat with them, the more painful it was, right? And as I had to process that and get go through my own motions. Now, if I knew then what I know now, that process could be sped up to like a few weeks to a month at most. But, you know, you got to go through the fire sometimes to be able to learn to not go through the fire to begin with. Dude, I resonate with that so much. The The part where you're talking about how like once you're aware of something, you can't just ignore it anymore. It's just going to sit there and fester way more painfully than your denial ever let it fester. Yeah. And, and you're right. Like I remember in the start of my recovery journey, I want to hear more about yours, but in the start of my recovery journey, dude, I would ruminate on things for months on end. I would know about them. I just didn't know what to do with them or how to feel about them or how to change energetically to change them. So dude, I, I resonate with that a lot. I know the listeners are resonating with that as well. So dude, please this is the juice right here. I'm excited for this gold nugget. I know you're about to drop one. So tell us what, yeah, go, go for it. <laughs> so I would imagine the gold nugget you're waiting for is how did I pull myself out? Because I had to do it by myself. Again, going back to the high achiever aspect, top performer, I didn't allow people in. I actually pushed people away, which meant that I was the only one that was going to come to save me. And it took me months to realize that. But in the midst of that chaos, chaos, the first thing I did was, well, all my life I've asked myself the question, what's my purpose in this life? What's the reason I'm here? Because to me, it never made sense that all of us, 8 billion people or however many we are, have the same purpose. Grow up, go to school, have some kids, get a job. Hopefully you raise those kids well and then pass on. Right, to me, that never made sense. But I never had the answer for it until I said enough is enough in 2022 in the summer of it. And I started researching and researching. And when I get passionate about a topic, I can spend you know 12 hours in a row, 60 hours in a week and not blink an eye and, and, and go deep. And that's what I did. I spent hundreds of hours looking into anything to do with purpose, anything to do with why. A book by Simon Sinek called Start With Why was the catalyst for all of this. And that's what I did. I started with why. So even though I discovered my why in the, in the summer of 2022, I did nothing with it for six months. Why? Because I skipped what I have later found to be the most critical step of all of this. And that's the first step in my system as well. So anyone that comes into my world and works with me, that's where we start. And that first step, Chase, is your foundation. Okay. Now, if you want to build a house, what do you build first? You build the foundation. 
Right. If I'm buying a property with an old home and I'm tearing down the old home, I either have to reinforce the foundation to build something new on top, or I have to tear the foundation down and build something new in its place. Well, what's our foundation as human beings? The way I see it, our foundation is our psychology, which is below the mindset, below all that fluffy stuff. It's your thoughts and beliefs about yourself, others, and the world. Because you see, as you grow up in the first seven years of your life, your conscious mind is not yet formed. So everything in your environment gets absorbed at your subconscious level. And you start to pick up stories from other people. Pick up stories from my grandparents, from my parents, from the caretakers. And keep in mind, my first seven years were in Eastern Europe during some of the hardest time Romania ever faced. Poverty, scarcity, death, you name it. And that's how I grew up. Now, I was shielded technically by most of it, but we know how energy transfers. So that meant I picked up on the energy of everyone else. So this foundation is what pretty much skyrocketed my transformation. As soon as I realized that this was the missing piece, I then devoured psychology books, stumbled upon this neuroencoding method and why I'm a neuroencoding specialist myself. And I was able to go further faster at record speeds. That's why people started asking me, it's like, how have you gone from this to this so fast? How do you have time to do all these things? It's because I was able to stumble upon and discover a system that would build a strong foundation which your psychology, and then follow it with your why, follow it with your gifts and strengths, then building a vision around that, and then executing it. And That's so cool. That's that so cool, happened. dude. That's so awesome. That's so awesome, dude. As I was thinking about this, it's like I always try and think about titles, right, to give my episodes. And I, for yes. without a shadow of a doubt, this is going to be my mental health masterclass episode because <laughs> you have just dropped truth after truth after truth after truth. So, dude, thank you so much. Like. And I agree with you full heartedly, man. There's in my religion, they teach the wise man built his house upon the rock. Yes. Right. You cannot, you can't have any, you can't have anything good unless you have the foundation to support it. So I, I love that you taught that. I love that. You Can we take a few minutes to dive into that a bit on the yeah. foundation? Because I feel like this will be the part where someone listening, if you take anything from what Chase and I discussed is this, because this has the power to change your life like nothing else. Right. And yeah, I would love to dive into that. So dude, like for me, I, I know you talk about like those, those stories that you believe about yourself and others and your religion and the world. And you talk about, you know, the seven, you know, up until you're the age of seven, a lot of people, they develop really shaky foundations, no, not even by choice, right? It's, it's those things that are taught to them. And yeah, let's hear, how do you change in your opinion, the foundation from a shaky to a, to a solid foundation? Great question. I, I want to I wanna say you're absolutely right. Everything you just said, there, right? Like you come into this world and you have to be taken care of for the, at least the first seven years. Right? For most of us, it's a lot more than that, which means that you are at the mercy of your environment. The parents you're born under or one parent in some families, right? The caretakers, the society you're, you're born in. And most people you encounter in life only want the best for you. Now I know that Tragic things happen and there's a lot of trauma around that. I'm not dismissing that. But if you look on average, most people you encounter want the best for you. Your parents want the best for you. So then they'll tell you, hey, you got to do this because that's what they've learned from their parents. And maybe them. Exactly, right? So, But not all of it applies to who you are as a human being. And not all of it applies to the time that you are going through right now, right? Because if it's something that my parents learned 20 years ago and they're trying to apply it to me now, or in my case, something that they learned in Romania in the communist time and apply it to me now when I'm in a democratic country, you know, two decades later, it, it doesn't really match, right? But people don't realize that. Again, it's all done out of love. So the first step, as you mentioned earlier, you so beautifully said it as well, is awareness. So becoming aware of your thoughts and beliefs is actually a lot harder than, than you may believe. And that's your foundation, right? And here's the reason why. And again, this is coming from science as well. They have found that about 95% of your thoughts and beliefs, which then lead to your feelings and emotions and then lead to actions and then lead to outcomes. So again, 95% of the entire chain happens subconsciously. Like for example, take something basic. You, your heart beats a lot, right? How many times a minute I forgot. 
Well, you're not actually doing that, right? Like at the conscious level, it's being done at the subconscious level. But what happens when someone says something and triggers you? Your subconscious kicks in. And then before you realize it, you're either reacting. So let's say someone cuts you off in traffic. This is a common one for many people. What happens next? You get angry. Right? You react right away because there is a, a belief usually that gets triggered first. But it goes so fast from belief to feeling an emotion. And then from feeling an emotion pretty quickly to action. And then back to more thoughts and beliefs. And then the cycle keeps going. That you can't really do much. So your foundation then becomes shaky because it's built on, and I like to call it because I'm someone in tech, built on outdated software, right? So if you have an iPhone or if you have an Android phone, what if you had one that was like 15 years old? Could you do the same things you're doing right now with the phone? Could you take us great pictures? Could you play the games or browse the, the websites you would need to browse? Probably not. And if you look at your life right now, your body is the hardware, so that's a device, and your software is all your thoughts and beliefs, everything at the subconscious level. And a lot of it is very outdated, right? It could be from the first seven years. A lot of it actually is. So I'm 40 right now. So that means I'm running like what? 35 plus years old software in my system. Mm -hmm. Just probably not conducive to the life I want to live. So then the question comes down to, okay, now you're becoming aware that you're working with some technology that is not up to standard. What do you do? Because 95% of the stuff you do is at the subconscious level. Well, that's where the power of a couple of things comes in. One, reflection. The power of doing what I call a pattern interrupt. The power of asking questions. The power of being in the moment. The power of mindfulness. And these are all different methods that allow you to essentially become aware of your thoughts and beliefs and start challenging them. Because the first step, as we mentioned, awareness. So you become aware, well, I have a thought right now. Let's say I'm not good enough because I just had a meeting with my manager and they told me I did something wrong. And the immediate thought that comes to mind is that I'm not good enough or belief because that I've heard it a lot when I was growing up, when I was annoying my parents, for example, or my teachers. And when a negative thought gets triggered or belief, what happens next? The feeling and emotion associated with that gets triggered. And then a, a cycle begins right, with more thoughts and beliefs. So I'm not good enough can then turn into, I never get anything right. Why bother? Why try? All these things start to happen and then actions start to happen. So when you feel less than, and I was riddled with this, by the way. So when you feel less than, what do you do? You may opt to escape in a computer game instead of actually working on your project or spending time with your loved ones going for a walk or going to the gym or doing any of those things. And that perpetuates the system, right? And it continues to build that belief that that's actually what you want to do because you see, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. You find, you find the truth. You subconsciously start to look for the truth that you're not enough. Exactly. I saw that you said that because that's about what I was going to say. Your brain doesn't care if what you're telling it or what you're thinking is true or, or false. It actually doesn't have a way to even tell. So if I say I'm not good enough, Subconscious mind is like, okay, you're not good enough. Here's proof. Because it's going to go look for proof, right? And we all right. have proof when we felt like we weren't good enough or someone else made us feel like we were not good enough. But I challenge you to look for proof the other way around. I am good enough. See what comes up. And for most of us, it's, there's more proof of that, but we have to go looking for it. And, and, you know what? and, and I agree with you too. And maybe to give some people some like some meat on the bone to go with this too. Being good enough is waking up in the morning, right? Being good enough is maybe brushing your teeth three times a week. Being good enough is eating a meal and drinking Mountain Dew all day. Being good enough is being existing. Seriously, you know, like I, I'm a firm believer that every single person on this earth is doing their best with what they got, right? Though even the people that are doing heinous crimes, they're doing the best with what they got, right? And you're good enough because of that, right? If you can wake up in the morning and look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm super depressed. I want to die, right? Those things, those places that you and I have both been at, you're still enough. You're still good enough. You were good enough to get up out of bed and go say that to yourself. And how much better could your life be if you got out of bed and instead of saying, I'm super depressed, you could say, you know what? I'm a work in progress. <laughs> and I'm good enough. 
Yes, yes, yes. I love that. Let me give you an easy exercise for you and for the audience. Okay. One that everyone cringes as soon as they hear it. And even the first few times you do it, you're going to cringe. Mm-hmm. But every client I've worked with, and that includes myself, have said, hands down, this is one of the best exercises, simplest exercises to build up that belief in self and that love for self that we should all have. But yet, like you said, a lot of us struggle with that because of the environment, because of our beliefs and whatnot. And here's, it's a simple exercise and I'm going to ask you a question. The exercise is this, whenever you wake up in the morning and you start your day, you're going to go to the, to the bathroom. Most people end up going there anyway. And in the bathroom, you likely have a mirror. Look, look in the mirror and say four magical words as you put a big smile on your face. What do you think those four words are, Chase? I love you, Chase. Ah, you know it. Yes. I do. This is the exercise. The, the, my mentor from the Neuron Coding Institute, he's the one that taught me this. And honestly, Chase, I struggled implementing that for weeks before I said, you know, fine, I'll do it. And now every time I walk by a mirror, even if I'm on my phone, I can put a selfie mode on or in the car, mm-hmm. I do this. And there's scientific reason why that works. But think about what you just did, because when you when you said that, you had the biggest smile on your, on your face, right? Yeah, like, I knew it was coming. You I know it's coming and I know it's true. From years of doing it, I know it's so, <laughs> so true. I love that. Yeah, here. And I'm going to I'm going to add one step to it. Yes, please do. You have, to, you have to look at yourself in the eyes when you say it. Oh, yes. A hundred percent. When you're looking in the mirror in the morning and you got those bags on your eyes and your head, your hair is all messy. Look yourself in the f- mirror and do it five times, five to 25 times in the morning. You got it takes you a couple seconds. Just look at yourself and say, I love you, Chase. Or don't say Chase, your name, actually. But <laughs> I love your name. Um, <laughs> Name, I love you, right? I do Constantine, I love you. But let me let me add one thing that you said five to 25 times. For most people, even one time will be tough at the beginning. Right. And that's where grace comes in. If you can do it five to 25 times, like Chase said, perfect. Then build up to it and do it. But start with one time and don't beat yourself up. Because here's what happens and why this is so important, Chase. And for some people, this becomes more relevant once they understand why it works. First of all, think about what happens when you wake up in the morning. You wake up, you get out of bed, you stub your toe on the nightstand. How is the rest of your day going to progress? We all know that, right? Or you go downstairs, you put the coffee on, and you forget to put the coffee filter in or whatever else, right? And now you don't have coffee. How is that going to impact your day? Right. Well, flip that on its head, because if something negative can really impact your day negatively quite a bit, or at least your morning, that means that something positive can do the same by making it positive. So when you start doing this first thing in the morning, you're setting up your day for success, right? You're starting with a small win right away. And you talked about being good enough, Chase, and that was so beautiful. Like you hit the nail on the head. This is about being good enough. It's like, yes, I see me. I love myself. I appreciate myself. I celebrate myself. And yes, it can sound cringy. Try it and see what happens after a week, after two weeks, after three weeks, because they will begin a journey of self-love, a journey of respecting yourself, giving yourself grace, giving yourself a pass for being in the situation you're in, because that means you can also pull yourself out of that. Amen. And you know, I think the, I love you like Chase, I love you or the Constantine. I love you. It evolves over time. Right. So I, I did the, I love you for a long time. And so I'm a firm believer in the teachings of Debbie Ford. And she, she has a book called the dark side of the light chasers where she believes that every answer is inside of you. Everything you need to hear and need to know is within you. And I did a meditation in one of her books where I, in near the end of her book, I spoke with my higher self in this book. And I asked this person to give me this, you know, my subconscious to give me a mantra, to give me something that I say every time I see a sticky note in my house. And the mantra is I'm worthy. I'm a warrior and I'm a fighter for the hearts of men. And that's my mantra. And I don't say I love you anymore, Chase, because I know it. And so, and and I love what you said too, man. If you could, even if you can't say it once, right? My wife has a really beautiful way of saying this. She says, hey, she'll look at herself in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm capable of loving you. I'm working towards loving you. So if you can't look at yourself in the mirror, for those listening, if you can't look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, Jane Smith, I love you. How about you say, hey, Jane Smith, I'm working on loving you. Or, hey, Jane Smith, I'm capable of loving you. And allow that to slowly evolve over time. Love it, Chase. And what what comes up as you say that as well is everyone is a unique human being. 
one, one thing that comes up that chase is that we are all unique human beings, right? Which means that what works for me might not work for you. And if we look at us as human beings, I look at it two ways, right? We have the hardware, which is our body, which for most of us is pretty much the same, right? We have all the same parts. Where we are different, of course, is at the software level, which includes, of course, all your thoughts and beliefs. And for us more spiritual people, it also includes your higher self, your soul, your spirit, whatever your name is, right? That's what makes you unique. So those are the parts I want to go after when I look at myself and be like, well, if I'm going to work with you, Chase, as an individual, you are unique. I know that this works for most of us because it touches the hardware. So then let's implement it. But if it's something that touches beyond the hardware, then you have to make it your own, right? And like you said, it could be that this phrase doesn't work for everyone, and that's fine. But you don't know until you try it. And trying it once and giving up is not really trying either, right? So give it give it a shot. If it doesn't work, toss it, take the rest, right? Try the next thing. Give it two weeks. If you can say one sentence once a day for two weeks, maybe it can change your life. Maybe that sentence doesn't work. And I love that. So Constantine, my next question for you, bro. Obviously, you are thriving in your life. Looking back at everything you've gone through, what can you appreciate about all the hard stuff you had to go through? All of it. So, you know, gratitude is something that's been playing a huge role in my life. I'm actually grateful for all the times I've gone through. And I've been asked this question a lot around if I could go back in time, would I change anything? And I honestly, I would say no, because going through those dark moments also came with very beautiful moments that I ignored in the moment, but going back, I could look at them and celebrate them. Those hard moments came with a lot of lessons that perhaps in the moment I didn't take them. But now with the power of hindsight, I can go back and I can learn and learn and learn. And you said something beautiful, which is all the answers are inside, which means that Everything I've gone through holds a gift or multiple gifts inside of me. It's my choice if I want to open them. So I ask you, do you want to open your gifts? And if yeah. you don't, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay, right? If you don't want to open your gifts and that's really what's going to help you become your best self, good on you. I, yeah. I commend you, right? <laughs> if it does, if opening your gifts helps you and it's going to help you become your best self, cool. I commend you. Either way, you're a great person. Either way, you're enough. So- I love that. Yeah. So in my last question for you, Constantine, so much advice has been shared today, but specifically for those just getting into the realm of mental health, what advice do you have for those people? Oh, that, there's a couple of things that come up. I actually had a beautiful conversation with someone last night around what I would do first if I could go back in time and, you know, talk to myself going through that. And it's, this is the advice I would give myself and I would give anyone listening at the beginning of this is realizing that you are not alone. Because you see, you may think you are alone. You may think your problems are yours and no one else is going through that and no one else can understand you. And that's exactly what I believed. However, that was the farthest thing from the truth. There were so many people willing to help. Immediate family, coworkers, my manager, people everywhere in life. Yet because of my perception, I didn't allow them in. I actually pushed them away. So if you can, take a quick look and see, are you truly alone? And if you have no one in your immediate surroundings that can listen to you, that can provide a non-judgmental listening ear, then there are communities online, right? The community that Chase is growing here with the podcast, the community I'm growing with Unleash Thyself, the communities around the globe and especially North America, there are plenty of them. So you're definitely not alone. Take that first step and just, it just takes one conversation. And my phrase that came to me this weekend in meditation chases, just reach out to me or to anyone else and go with no judgment, just love, right? So when I, when I reach out to a friend or saying, Hey, do you want to chat? No judgment, just love. That's how I ended because that's the, the state I want to get my, I am aiming for, which is if you come to me, and you want to have a conversation, there will be no judgment, just love. And if we can do that for other people, then others can do it for us too. Amen. Amen, Constantine. This is awesome. So, bro, thank you so much for coming on my show today and just doing your thing and taking over and sharing so much of your love, non-judgment, all of, all of this stuff. It's so good. This is a masterclass. Seriously, this is a mental health masterclass. 
So for those who want to get in contact with you or want to watch your show or want to get involved with your coaching, what, what's everything you have going on? How can yes. they get in contact with so you? Thank you for that, Chase. I know we are talking offline about the event that's coming up. So this is an event. It's the first of its kind I'm putting on, but it's something that I truly believe can and will change people's lives. And because of that, I'll be doing these events every four to eight weeks, depending on the, the scale of it. But the first event is May 9th, and it's from 6 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. And this event is about going into my system, going through my journey, so you'll get to hear more of what we talked about, about going deeper. And then at the end of it, well, as you go through it, and at the end, you get to go away with the tools and the system you could use to change your life from that moment on. You get the software update. Exactly. Well, yeah, you got you get the CD. Let's let's go back a few. <laughs> you, get <laughs> you get the CD to update the software. They have yeah, to go apply it. Yeah, then it's your choice, right? It's your choice. Do you do you apply it by yourself? Do you apply it with someone else? Do you even go down that path? But at least you have the information. You have the tools. You have all all the updates you need. Now, that event is called Calm Success Live. And it's going to be at calmsuccesslive.com. That's where you're going to find all the information. You're going to sign up. You're going to see all the events. Everything that it's about, again, it's about giving back and getting you to a place where you can take control of your life and essentially stop giving your power away to others like I've been giving my power away to others all my life. So with that, uh, Chase, I'll add one more thing. If you want to connect with me personally, best way is go to LinkedIn, Constantine Bomorun. Connect with me there. Send me a message. I'm always willing to chat with anyone. Unleash thyself, the podcast. You can find it on YouTube and any of the major podcasting platforms. And beyond that, that's pretty much it. I want to thank you, Chase, for the amazing conversation, the beautiful questions, and the platform you're building. So thank you so much. Dude, Constantine, thank you for coming on. Again, in the comment description, all that stuff's going to be on there. His LinkedIn, his podcast. Um, he's going to send me the link for his his cool event that he's got coming up in May. So I'm going to have that in there as well, guys. Go check him out. Obviously, this guy is a wealth of knowledge and he is willing to share it freely. So no, Constantine, thank you, bro. Thank you for coming on and sharing all of your stuff, man. It means the world to me. Like you said, phenomenal conversation. And for those watching, if you haven't already liked and subscribed, please make sure to do so. If you have thought about someone throughout this episode that you know could benefit from all of the lessons that Constantine taught you, I invite you to share this episode with them. Please do so. Let them know that you care about them, right? Let's let people know they're not alone. Let's build the tribe of wellness together. Yes. And Chase, I was going to add one more thing because we forgot. You're going to be on my show as well. That's Here's right. Me. So... Of course, Chase is going to let you know when that goes live and you can go check out his beautiful story and more of it because that's when I'm going to shut up and Chase is going to talk. <laughs> it sounds like a good plan, man. It's it's actually funny. I haven't come on my show yet. I haven't been a guest on my own show. So a lot of people listening probably don't know a lot of my story. So yeah, definitely check it out once it comes out. And once we get filmed, that's going to be a lot of fun. And guys, if anyone else wants to come on my show, I want you to know that this is a podcast for you. No name is too big. No story is too small. If you have a story, I want to share it all. You can contact me at chase at the wellness center dot life. If you want to know more about what I do on my day to day basis, how I help with mental health, go to www.thewellnesscenter.life, where we use full body red light therapy to rejuvenate and change every cell in your body one session at a time. Again, everyone, thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and we'll catch you guys on the flip side. Peace out.